All right. We got a car video. Woo! Uh, I want to talk about Ezekiel 33 today because it's something I struggle with. So pretty sure it's something other people struggle with. And yeah, mm -hmm. it's going to get hot and heavy, as they say. <sighs> Start off with sort of an analogy with our own justice system. There's a crime in our justice system called depraved indifference or depraved heart murder, in which you can be charged with second degree murder for refusal to help someone that's dying or has died. Uh, for example, if you... If you watch a kid fall into the pool and drown, don't do anything, like don't call an ambulance or something, you just sit there reading a book or something, you can be charged with murder for that because you had the power to help them and you didn't. I'm pretty sure there's some states that's not a thing, and I don't know about across the whole world, but in general, that is a you can be charged with that crime. Depraved heart murder, as they say. <laughs> The death is on your hands, even though you didn't actively go push them into the pool or anything or anything like that. And it parallels with the passage in Ezekiel 33, uh, verses 1 through 9. Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of thy people and say unto them, When I bring the sword upon a land, if the people of the land take a man of their coast and set him for their watchmen, if when he seeth the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet and warn the people, then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet and taketh not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet and took not warning, his blood shall be upon him. But he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. But if the watchmen see the sword come and blow not the trumpet, and the people be not warned, if the sword come and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity. But his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. So thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore shalt, therefore thou shalt hear the word of my, at my mouth, and warn them from me. When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die, if thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way. That wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Nevertheless, if thou warn the wicked of his way to turn from it, and he do not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. It's pretty heavy. Basically, the watchman in the tower is responsible or er, if the people in the village die because the watchman did not warn them of the danger then the blood will be at the watchman's hand even though it was a different like the watchman didn't kill him he just couldn't care less so to speak and uh god's standards don't change our god does not change he has the same standards today as he did in the old testament so that would also apply to Christians sharing the gospel. Okay. If you don't share the gospel with somebody, that is you as the watchman not warning them of the danger. You didn't directly kill them, but their blood will be on your hands. If you do warn them and they don't listen, then you've delivered thy soul, as Ezekiel says. <sighs> Ow. I ruffled the feathers of a coworker the other day because he thinks we should not preach hellfire and brimstone as Christians to a lost person. We He thinks we should just tell them about all the good things in heaven. That... It's unrealistic. Christians are promised trials and tribulations. And so it's it's not even all perfect, you know. It's not like it's going to be a fun experience for you. Uh, 
I got an analogy to go with that one too. Um, the lost person needs to know about hellfire and brimstone and that God will pay them with hell for their sins or they see no reason of accepting Jesus as their savior. Imagine you're the watchman in the tower from Ezekiel. It's late at night. It's a bit chilly out. You don't have your coat on. You're sitting there shivering. Across the horizon, you see the army approaching. The danger is coming. And then you go to your neighbors. And you say, come with me. I can take you to somebody that can save you. You don't tell them about the danger. You just start screaming at, start screaming at their door at 2 a.m. in the middle of the night. They're not going to listen to you. They're going to think you're a crazy person. <sighs> now imagine scenario two. You see the danger on the horizon still. The army's coming. But this time you go to your neighbors and then you tell them, hey, there's an army coming to destroy this village. You got to get out of here. They don't believe you. Take them up to the watchtower. Show them the proof. Take them up to the watchtower with you. Show them. Point to the army that's coming. Then try to say, hey, we got to get out of here. They're going to listen. They're not going to think you're a crazy person anymore. Uh, I think they call that a paradigm shift is what they say. That's the word for that. They no longer think you're a crazy person because they see the danger too. So, I mean... I'm not good at articulating what I want to say, but I hope the idea is getting across. Uh, I got another one. Didn't come up with on my own. This is a Ray Comfort one. Um, imagine you go up to somebody that's sick with cancer and you try to give them a cure for it. You're like, hey, I got the cure for cancer, brother. They're going to think you're crazy, man, because the cure of cra the cure for cancer doesn't exist. All right. Probably think you're trying to sell them drugs or something. But if you show them a diagnosis, hey, look, you got cancer. These are the symptoms. One, two, three. <clears throat> you got like six months to live. And then you say, hey, I got the cure for cancer. They don't care what it is. They're going to try it. You got to show somebody the danger before they accept the solution. If somebody doesn't see a problem, why would they implement a solution? Basically, is what I'm trying to say. If a lost man thinks they're a good person, and they do, uh, Proverbs 21 says, every man is right in his own eyes. If a lost man thinks they're a good person, then why would they think they need to accept Jesus? Why would a loving God send them to hell that's true a loving God doesn't send a good person to hell the problem is that they are not good and then the problem for us Christians is how do we convince someone that they are wicked <clears throat> and I think from listening to other people preach and reading my Bible that it is essential to use the law Moral law, moral law, Coles law, not Coles law. <laughs> and listen, <clears throat> you got to use the law when witnessing to somebody to convince them of their sins. It's kind of like the Ray Comfort thing, but in my own words. <clears throat> listen to these very closely, these verses about the law. Romans three nineteen through 20. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall be no flesh justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. That one right there pretty much summarizes everything up. <clears throat> every mouth will be stopped and everyone will become guilty before God. <clears throat> I mean, I, but I got more of it. Yeah, there's more verses about this. Galatians 3.24 Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. <sighs> Psalms 19.7 The law of the Lord is perfect. Perfect. Converting the soul. Romans 7.7 7. 
What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law. For I had not known lust except the law said thou shalt not covet. So that that gives us what law we're talking about. It's the Ten Commandments is what I'm specifically talking about here. Uh, I don't remember the verse, and I don't have it written down here, so I can't give you a reference, but there's one that says, uh, like, the work of the law is written on their conscience or something like that. I'm going to have to look this up. I don't got time for that right now. Whatever, we'll just skip over that one because I'm not remembering it. But we can look at Jesus' example, too, when he was on earth with the rich young ruler. And Luke 18, 18 through 20. And a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to, unto him, Why callest thou me good? None is good, save one that is God. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother. <laughs> Jesus used the Ten Commandments to witness to this guy. right I don't think he just randomly chose something to say you know I feel like he kind of knows what he's doing and if Jesus is using the Ten Commandments to convict somebody of their sins I'd say it's pretty biblical <clears throat> I mean the Bible is pretty explicit when it comes to using the law to confronting someone's sins. The preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolish. You can't just try and give them solutions. Say, hey, Jesus died for you. Come to heaven. It doesn't make any sense to them. Are commanded to preach. My train of thought really isn't here today, but it'll get across eventually. Uh, you don't need to be like a, a pastor to be considered a preacher, I don't think. Preach just means like to teach about something morally. Um, yeah. Anyone can preach. So when Romans says, How shall they call on him whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him who they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? You can be that preacher, whether you're a pastor with a degree, whether you're a female, you don't need to go a female. I don't think a female should be a pastor of a church. The Bible is pretty explicit on that, but that's a different subject. We don't have to, not gonna, not gonna start anything here. <laughs> <clears throat> but yeah that's that's all I got I just wanted to cover Ezekiel 33 I think it's important the gist of the message is that if you don't witness to somebody their blood will be required at your hands like I said this is something I struggle with I don't like to talk to people. I don't like talking to strangers. I don't like confrontations. When I do talk to somebody, I try to make it sound like I'm agreeing with everything that they're saying. And then dip out of there real quick so I don't have to talk to them anymore. So this is really not my thing, but... I think I've figured it out. Couldn't figure out why. Because I want to. I want to talk to them. I want to witness to people. It's not like uh, I couldn't care less. I want to share the gospel with people. And it's... Painful whenever I see someone that I want to talk to and I can't. I won't, I should say, because I can talk. 
I won't talk to them because I'd rather not talk about confrontational subjects. So really it's a matter of pride is what it sounds like to me. Are you too prideful to witness to somebody and I mean, because a complete stranger is not even going to... Most people these days will think you're a crazy person anyways. Even if you preach hellfire and brimstone. But it's worth it if you save... If you lead one person to Christ. As the Bible says, the angels in heaven rejoice over one soul that's saved. So... Just... Not really sure where I'm going with this now, but Ezekiel 33, it really had an impact for me. Alright, I am considering going to ruffle the feathers of more Jehovah's Witnesses again. Might get the police called on me, because last time they said we weren't invited back. Unless you were going to listen to their services, so. I might make a video from a jail cell eventually. <laughs> okay, bye!